timing is just right for this forum. And um, so one thing I just wanted to give you some logistics is that if you have at the question and answer time, if you have a question, we'd like for you to put it in the chat and then a moderator who is Jen Schultz will um, recognize you and then you'll be able to unmute and ask your question. So welcome and I shall turn this over to Jen. Good morning, everyone. I think it's, it's yeah, it's 11 o'clock. Good morning. For those of you I haven't met before, my name is Jen Schultz or Jennifer Schultz, I guess I would say. Um, and I am so excited. I have, I was blessed to meet um, Irene um, about a month ago, I think, um, mm -hmm. as a reach out um, for having a better understanding of how churches might step into a place of a living amends with um, the community of folks that Irene actually serves. El Centro, um, I've asked her to share about, is a nonprofit organization in Kansas City that is dedicated to serving the Latinx population and has been doing so for a number of years. She's gonna share uh, the history of El Centro and then really how they've transitioned as our world has changed for the community they care for. Um, Irene is the CEO and or president um, of El Centro. And I have to say just in the little bit of time I've been able to share uh, with her, she's a great uh, example of how I think we're all called to be the hands and feet of Christ. Mm -hmm. So she's gonna share a bit and then um, we're going to open up at that point for you guys to ask questions. Um, I encourage you to use her as a resource. Um, she has been just incredibly helpful for me. And, um, and I just want to say thank you, Irene, for being here. I know your schedule is crazy, especially right now. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity always to be able to share uh, El Centro's work and our history and, uh, you know, how we're handling things today. Uh, but I'll start off by, uh, again, Jennifer, thank you and, and saying that it is definitely a pleasure to be uh, with you today, even in this kind of forum. Um, I'm a hug type of person. I am a, you know, just kind of, so um, this, this sometimes gets me a little aggravated, but at the same time, uh, being able to at least meet new people in this kind of form is always um, a pleasure for me to be able to do. I just wish we could be able to do it in person. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the history. Uh, El Centro actually was organized uh, through the Catholic Church, actually back in 1976, a priest by the name of Father Ramon Gaetan uh, actually came from Topeka to Kansas City in 1976, where actually two years earlier, he was in Topeka and had organized a, what he called a service to the community. And what he noticed was that there was a larger Spanish speaking population that was not, needs were not being met. So he organized El Centro Topeka, which is, I'll, I'll explain a little bit different than um, El Centro Kansas City. So in 76, when he came in, uh, he noticed the same thing. He, he landed in the Argentine Armadale district of Kansas City, Kansas. And noticed uh, um, a vast number of older adults, of migrant children that were coming into the community where language uh, most definitely connected all of, um, all of them, but services were not. So uh, he asked the diocese to support um, community interest and community organizers uh, to develop El Centro. So we are a 45 year old organization and our history is very uh, different in who we serve. So in those early stages, it was about transporting older adults to health appointments. It was about tutoring young migrant children that were coming in and out and helping uh, their parents who worked in the agricultural field 
uh, just kind of adapt and develop and, and needs met. Uh, and and um, it was that way for a long time because who was actually the, uh, the core people that offered support was the Cordy and Marion sisters who were out of Texas. So there were really more uh, uh, actually led by religious, um, the, the Catholic religious community, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and not necessarily the lay community. But until uh, things changed um, almost instantly when uh, they hired uh, one of the founders, but he was a, a board member, Richard Ruiz, uh, who was at the helm. And uh, we, somewhere around the 80s, uh, late 80s, uh, changed who we served. And at that time, if you recall, um, the Reagan administration had uh, actually put into place the amnesty that helped um, those that were undocumented actually move into a pathway to citizenship. So El Centro changed focuses in a way that met um, needs of citizenship. So the idea was signing people up, helping people pass the test, working on ELL. Um, so that huge movement of moving folks from uh, undocumented to documented was a huge focus for us. Um, as we moved through the 90s and 2000s, one of the things that we wanted to be was more um, a moving moving folks forward and, and really building an opportunity for folks to feel like they were a part, are a part of our community and, and make this their community. So um, Richard Ruiz, who was still at the helm, um, began this vision of what is the one thing to kind of close the gap of wealth in, in our community and really build community? It was around homes. Um, so in, in 2000, uh, he became a, a community home builder. At that same time, uh, actually was when we kind of broke away from the church. And what I mean break away is that we actually were not only a 501c3 under the auspice of the church, but all of our benefits, all of our, 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 everything that we did centered around underneath the archdiocese and the church. But in 2000, the discussion with the archdiocese was centered around funding. Federal funding for housing could not come to the agency if we were that connected to the church. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a discussion that we would still be a ministry of the church. So we still, do value our roots in the Catholic Church and still do work with our uh, diocese as long as we don't go against the Catholic teachings. Um, that the diocese agreed that we could kind of form our, our own 501c3, generate our own board, um, kind of work within our own policies and principles and and really kind of organized uh, as a as a nonprofit uh, that that began to fundraise. Um, not that we weren't fundraising before, but we did get a lot more support from uh, from the diocese than we do now. Um, but what that did was just kind of uh, break away from really more of the regulatory and, or more of the the policies and those type of things uh, in an effort to get some funding for housing. Um, El Centro at that time grew into, uh, we had 10 buildings, including two apartment complexes. We were building homes. The idea was that we, we wanted to take away victimization from our uh, population and uh, put them in, in apartments before we would then move them as homeowners and, and, and really kind of build capacity for the family. Um, so the idea was moving away from emergency assistance and emergency crisis really into, into helping them move forward. So it wasn't just housing. We also had so many social ser service or, um, uh, with, um, with things like ELL and, and still had citizenship and still had the adult programming. We had some health initiatives. Um, all of those things were factors in, in making sure that we helped people move 
themselves and their families forward as a way to identify with the community as a part of the community. But more importantly, that we were, we were opening up to the main, uh, the general community to accept uh, neighbors and, and people that were here um, uh, to, to value and to belong. So uh, that happened for a while until 2008. We all are aware what happened in 2008 and 2009 uh, with the housing crisis that really began a recession. And it impacted our work. It in, impacted who we were. Um, but it also helped strengthen um, the agency in, in an unusual way uh, in that uh, what's unprecedented is for an, an, a nonprofit to have an endowment. But when we sold off some of our, our facilities and some of our, uh, and we got out of the housing industry because we had to find a way to refocus. And, and um, so at that time, we had 10 buildings, uh, over 100 staff members. We were in both counties of Wyandotte and Johnson. Um, we had to refocus and we had to, um, at that time, figure out how we were going to keep our doors open. So in selling off property, it really helped us develop an endowment. We uh, moved from 100 to about 25 staff members and operating out of two buildings. Um, so from, from huge to, to small again to focus. But one of the things that we did that, that uh, has always been of value is that we listen to the population. And the idea behind uh, really uh, understanding what was the need and where we were going to go uh, was not for people to follow, but for us to, to really um, follow what the need was and build an organization that really uh, continued to listen and meet the needs. In about 2009, um, is when, or 2010, you can give or take, uh, is when we actually developed who we are today. Um, and what we did was focus on uh, what the needs were, continuing to keep that vision and purpose of our original um, you know, folks before us and uh, created uh, what we know is as an opportunity to continue to listen to to create some cultural humility and don't think that we know everything about our population. So still, still um, value that listening. And um, what we moved into was uh, a dual language preschool with the opportunity to um, have our young people and families uh, really identify with their culture and language in a way that maintains it moving forward. Some of our biggest critics of our dual language preschool is actually our parents. And one of the things that's hard about that is the fact that we live in an environment that second languages are negative instead of assets. So a dual language preschool was important for us not only uh, to respect the language of, of about 75% of the kids that come in, but also to be able to have a relationship with parents, to be able to say, you, you are their first teacher, you continue to be their teacher, continue to speak the language, continue to read to them in Spanish. We'll get to the English. They're at an age where that is easily come. Um, but for you, we don't want you to see this as a negative. We want you to, to continue to, to uh, embrace your culture, embrace your language. So, um, so El Centro's mission today is, is actually um, to strengthen communities and improve the lives of Latinos through uh, education, social, and economic, um, and economic uh, empowerment. And uh, we do that with dual language preschool, health education, health navigation, uh, as well as uh, economic empowerment, and a, a whole lot of advocacy. So the dual language preschool is our education part, or part of our education. Um, we also have health uh, education, 
And what we did was we valued um, those in the community that needed just as much support, but were willing to be ambassadors for the organization. So we have a promotoras de salud, which are health promoters. Um, and these are actually volunteers in the, in the community that actually work with us. Um, the idea that, that was, was very much important to us was because they have just as much of a need, if we provide the information and education, um, embracing their language and their culture and do it in a way that, that gives them the skill set to go back home and make behavioral changes, um, that that was what we wanted to do. But what these promotoras ended up to be were uh, our ambassadors. And what they ended up to do is they ended up to go outside their home and they, and which is what we value about our community, right? A lot of the messaging comes from them talking to other people. So you can make a huge mistake that they're gonna talk about, uh, but sometimes we have to do like five or 10 great things in order for them to then feel good about who we are. But that's just who we are as humans, right? So, so one of the things that we valued was their ability to be able to be uh, ambassadors and, and get people to come through our door that would never. Um, as much as I love El Centro and, and, and people making an assumption that we only serve the Latino community, just because we have El Centro written up there doesn't mean that we that every uh, Latino that is in need that ha that is Spanish speaking comes through our door. We serve just to give you an idea. Um, in Wyandotte County, there are about forty one thousand Latinos that live in the county. Um, about thirteen thousand are estimated to be undocumented. Most of the families that we serve today, as we moved, you know, kind of into the, are mixed status families. So mm -hmm. there are some people in the home that, that uh, are undocumented and some people in the home that are, um, are United States citizens. They were born here. Um, and it's not always just the adults that are undocumented and the kids that are citizens. It is a variety of, of um, but they are mixed status. So, um, so to us, the value of having, we don't, we, we don't call them volunteers. That's not something that is, um, just so that you know, that, that is understandable in our community when working and, uh, you know, uh, being a part of the community uh, to volunteer doesn't quite set well. So ambassadors, not even leaders sit well with our community, but they are. There are our leaders and our ambassadors. And what they do for us is um, they go out and they have a toolbox of resources and, and a wealth of knowledge around nutrition. So their job is to, is to gather families help them understand uh, benefits that they might be available for, bring them in the door to, to get them to staff members and, and also teach um, uh, healthy habits. So the idea behind uh, nutrition is introducing them to places like farmer's market, introducing fruits and vegetables. And what, what they did for us is actually go to, to markets and see how people, they, they kind of researched how people, what people got when they were in the market and what we learned about our population. And I'd be one to admit, I was not raised with a plate that had fruit, vegetables, and a meat. We had a lot more meat on our plates than we did. And that's what they brought back to us was the knowledge and skill set of, you know, we, a lot of people are buy a lot, a lot of meat, but we don't see a lot of fruit and vegetables in the cart. So, so we do do education and programming and they do help us with um, not only getting the message out, but also training and, and helping with currently with our food distribution. Our health navigators are a bit different. Um, they are certified, trained uh, medical interpreters and they help navigate um, the health system. And what I can tell you about that is that even without a language barrier and even without uh, the insurance being underinsured or uninsured, 
we all have ish, we all have concerns and and are not quite aware of how that um, the how the health system, healthcare system works. So our navigators really are ones that help with financial assistance, prescription assistance, insurance, um, being able to navigate some of the billing. Um, they they help with eyeglasses, uh, um, hearing aids. They help with durable medical equipment. They help with um, general surgeries and specialty surgeries. And um, the idea is in some cases that we've been able to form relationships with hospitals and doctors for those that are uninsured in particular um, to be able to pay um, medical or Medicaid prices and, and be able to work with um, with our hospitals to be able to say, these are folks in your community and if they don't get served or serviced in a way, they're gonna land in your emergency room, which is a lot more expensive. So the idea to work with our uh, clinics and, and hospitals are ways to be able to um, hold health costs down, but also get folks to understand the population who we're serving today. Um, so in, uh, uh, in Johnson County, and, and we do everything the same in Wyandotte County that we do Johnson County, but I forgot to give you that statistic. Um, Johnson County has a few more Latinos uh, that live in the community. There's about 43,000 Latinos that live in the community. And um, there's about 11, little more than 11,000 that have been identified uh, or can estimated identified as uh, undocumented. Um, so, so meaning, again, the majority of them, what we used to see at the beginning and undocumented before that, that, strain, that, that push in the 80s for citizenship, predominantly were men who were coming over, working, and then going back. So they weren't really staying um, uh, to form a, a community or live in the community. What, we're, what we see today um, is definitely those that did not meet that citizenship in the 80s stayed and have created a family and, and now see a mixed status family. But um, so then, so those two are matched, the promotoras and the health navigators. And then the other thing is our, what we call economic empowerment. That is kind of our foundation or our base of um, making sure that the idea is not uh, as much as we can um, to work with uh, getting them out of uh, emergency assistance and always uh, in, in, in critical need, but to, through pathways to uh, certification training, job placement, um, any kind of opportunity that we can have uh, to, to help them with increasing savings. So it's about budgeting and banking and, uh, and, and really getting an understanding of what is it that they're gonna need in the future that they can save for today. What we know about the wealth gap is that um, for African-Americans and Latinos, we are very much behind uh, the ball where many um, families, many white families that have legacies are actually working for their grandkids or even great grandkids. Many of our African-American and Latino families are struggling just to, to be able to survive today. So there's no savings. There's no thought about future, whether it's retirement, whether it's saving for citizenship, whether it's saving for a child's college. Um, so one of the things that we do is, is very much make sure that the emphasis is, is around what is important to them. So if it's a citizenship, how do we look at savings and, and how do we make that happen by banking? Um, so all of, that, all, all of that is fundamental, but it's also about purchase, continuing to think about purchasing a house. First time home buyers education. We have volunteer income tax assistance sites. Um, for those of you that are not aware, um, a lot of the myth is that our undocumented population do not pay taxes. And um, that is not true. That is, is very false. And we, what we do is we're a site that provides an, uh, what's called an uh, identification, um, I-10, what is it? Individual tax identification number. 
It's what we call an I-10, and it's what the IRS uh, has actually put out to, uh, or actually put into place for any guests that come into the country and work, they expect taxes to be paid on that. So um, I-10s, we, we, we help our community who are working. Now, we don't encourage them to work without a work permit, but they do, they are working. So if they work, we encourage them to actually make sure that if they pay taxes, um, that it, it really will help in the future uh, when comprehensive immigration reform does happen because they're going to take a look at how long you've been in the, the country. They're going to take a look if you've paid your taxes. So we encourage our community um, to actually to do this uh, because it, it will help and it does help um, uh, for the future. So uh, I-10s are important, paying your taxes are important. Um, and and uh, so we, we have one, uh, a site in Wyandotte and a site in Johnson that we do that. We're doing that now in a safe environment. And then our last is advocacy. We, have, we do a whole lot of advocacy. So we still do citizenship clinics. We still do DACA clinics or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. I'll explain that very quickly. I don't want to make any assumptions that anyone doesn't does or doesn't know. So um, in 2010, uh, the country was really moving forward to uh, 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 what was called a Dream Act, and the Dream Act was really valuing those that were undocumented, that did pay taxes, that were in the community for a while, with an opportunity for a pathway to citizenship. Um, currently, as much as I would love to be able to tell you that those that are undocumented have a door to stand in. They don't even have a window to climb in to be able to get citizenship. It's not that easy. Uh, and, and don't let anyone tell you that it is because many of our families do not are not eligible to be able to stand in a, well, there is no line. Let me just put it that way. So one of the things um, that's that happened uh, when that failed in Congress in 2010, which we just felt was was actually going to happen. Uh, when that failed in 2010, uh, President Barack Obama uh, established an executive order that basically did not give he, he the president doesn't have authority to give citizenship. But what he did was give temporary relief to those young adults that came over. Um, you know, as young children, gave them an opportunity to have a work permit and a social security number as long as they were working and or going to school uh, or both. And um, so what this did was it, it created the DACA program, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival. Many of them are working, many of them are going to school, uh, many of them, uh, you know, are, are only know this as their as their country, uh, but they they still are undocumented. So um, so deferred action for childhood arrival still has we still have clinics. We still sign people up. We still make sure that they renew their DACA with the ability to be able to have uh, um, a refuge from being from being deported. Now it doesn't help their parents if they're undocumented, but it does help them. Um, and um, so we, we do citizenship, DACA, uh, we, we're, we're at the state house giving testimony, uh, bringing people to the state house, and we do a lot of advocacy uh, uh, locally, safe and welcoming, municipal IDs we, we've been heavily involved in in Roland Park and Wyandotte County and Lawrence and Topeka, um, with the thought that if we can build the community's awareness about things that impact the most and, and share their uh, stories and their voices and, and create opportunities for them to be more uh, engaged, it creates uh, most definitely some civic engagement and, and, and opportunities for them to be uh, uh, definitely part of, of our community. Uh, and that's what we're trying to create. So um, I'm trying to watch the time. Uh, I know that you have questions. Uh, I have not hit on, I think, what I need to hit on with you, but I can talk a lot about El Centro. But this is what I will tell you. We still have a great relationship with our Catholic churches, but we also know that our community 
um, is engaged in Pentecostal and uh, evangelical churches. More and more, uh, our, uh, our community is moving away from the Catholic Church um, and, and actually creating other uh, uh, churches. So we know we have to also engage um, where our community also, uh, is benefiting from. And, and one of the things that, that as part of the importance of uh, as you build your congregation or as you uh, think about working with the community, what I would say uh, is that's very helpful in working with our, our, our parishes and working with our churches around community is that we, all, we, we, we don't want you to reinvent the wheel. Uh, if you have a passion for an issue, um, there are people most definitely in the community that are doing things that you can you can actually uh, uh, work with. Um, the other thing is don't ignore. Um, there are people in your pews um, within your congregation that most definitely have um, that have issues and concerns. And what I, what I always, being a part of my church council, so here, here's where I'm gonna kind of change hats and, and now kind of be, be heavily involved in, or heavily involved in kind of thoughts, is that you also have people in your pews that are as a part of your congregation um, that, that also have some issues and concerns and start there. So you start with making sure that, um, that those are the folks that also live in the community, value the community. And the one thing that, um, that you wanna equip um, those that are in the pews with is to think outwardly, right? We always think of that, those four walls inwardly. And one of the things that we did with our church council, and and um, and I was kind of the loudest in going. You can't just assume people are going to come to you, right? And and a way to connect is a way is is also making sure um, that you know what your what's going on in your community, and it's a start with those that are in your pews because they could be going through and will be going through just as much. Talk to the leaders. Um, Build authentic relationships. That's what matters the most. And, and you want to, again, raise from within. So who are the people? We call, what we always say, I just want to give you an idea. We always say, uh, if we need to go into a community, we're working in Roland Park right now. And what we ask our community is, who has the most chisme, right? And chisme is the, the gossip. Who has the most gossip? Right, because those tend to be kind of your leaders that you can that you can help kind of to find out who and what and where what is happening. So so you want to you want to get your congregation involved. You want to pick an issue that is important to you to move outwardly. But what what I want um, what I want you to know that we did uh, within our council um, that was so eye opening. To, uh, to the priest and to other council members was get to know your community by reviewing demographics. Don't just stop there though, but um, know who's in your community and, and what tells the whole story is then merging some of those leaders and, and begin to talk about kind of the issues because then you'll learn who's doing what, right? So um, overall, uh, one of the things that that I would say, and and that I've told uh, our priest in our communities, um, is that you've got to collaborate with us, right? And you've got to move out of those four walls. And I know in some cases our priests have said, but I I have like four different churches I have to travel to, and you know between Saturday and Sunday, because and so we value that as well. Well, then who are the leaders in the congregation that we can get to then actually kind of utilize? And we've kind of stepped away from that, which is very much uh, interesting because we've stepped away from, I was raised actually where, where that was where we gave our time and effort in the church. And, and now I see more and more the difference of, of some of our families moving away. Not that they don't still value the church, uh, but it's not, it's not, 
uh, that's not a part of it. And I think we need to make sure that we have things to offer as, as community, um, but we also, but the church has uh, uh, so much to offer as well. When you talk about space, talent in your pews, when you talk about the opportunity to, to think about issues that are impacting folks that are sitting in the pews, um, it, it, it could be hunger, it could be um, uh, you know, mental health, um, so that we don't ignore, but how do we connect the outside with the inside? And um, there are places like Salvation Army in the community, Catholic Charities in the community, but social services um, are, you know, are there and, and are in places, uh, um, but there's also United Ways that can help kind of connect groups of interest and, and specific groups related to topics um, that I would also hope that you would value and reach out to. We love, um, we love anyone that reaches out to us because, because we can't do it all. We don't have enough resources to do it all, but we are willing to work with, um, you know, with spaces and places that, um, that one can honor um, our folks that don't have um, specific um, uh, myths or specific uh, issues around who we serve. That's the other thing, because we do serve a variety of folks and some undocumented, uh, but the families are important and they live here in our community. So what we value is giving information to uh, general population so that they know uh, one, not to stereotype or identify folks in a different way, but to really kind of value what they can contribute and, and be able to establish what our community means is definitely authentic relationships, but boundaries, but authentic relationships. So um, I'm trying to think, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at time, but I don't want to take away from the questions. So um, Jennifer, what did I miss? Because I know I could go on. What did I miss from what our conversation was? Well, you did outstanding. So thank uh, you. You did way better than you're giving yourself credit for. Uh, you know, I'm I was I started out by trying to follow at least a little guide I had and then went all over the place. So. <laughs> oh, you have a lot to talk about. So absolutely. You know, two of the things that we talked in particular about, um, and, and one I will say um, was um, eye-opening for me. You know, I, when I, I think it's easy to put blinders on and make assumptions that you can see a person um, that is struggling and that would need your help. And so knowing that it's, it's not, um, especially when you're talking about a situation where someone is um, not um, a citizen and they're currently undocumented, it, it is, they're not wearing a sign on their right. um, And recognizing that that is an all across Kansas City challenge. It's not certainly somewhere you need to get in your car to drive to. Right. So yeah. um, if you can talk a little bit more to how to um, communicate that you are a safe space for such people. Um, yeah. Secondly, um, if we're in a situation, because we do have the Oklahoma campus here also, um, and you're wanting, to, I guess, two scenarios. If you're wanting to get involved and help, how do you reach out to or find an organization such as yourself? Um, and um, do you serve in a mentor capacity for churches? Um, and then that are wanting to take more of an active role. And then lastly, if you wanted to, to not reinvent the wheel, but almost um, begin a concentrated effort or an intentional effort within your church to shift into this space of supporting this community of people, how would you recommend starting beyond to look at your demographics? Right. Um, so, the one thing that I can tell you about how we make it work is it's not, and, and I've, I said this to Jennifer, it's not Irene. <laughs> um, I have the um, ability to be more on a, a grass top, right? So, so those that we serve um, probably never see me, 
probably have no idea what um, you know what I do or what I what matters uh, because they're working with uh, you know from from a grassroots level. We're working with people in the community that uh, that definitely need that um, authentic ability to be able to understand who they are, not judge, value their language, and value their culture. Um, so the one thing I can tell you is that we, we put Spanish first. When you walk in the door, um, you're going to see the Spanish language all over, um, you know, what we do in our dual language preschool. Everything that is sold, for instance, is sold with the English word first and then the Spanish word. Well, we take that and we reverse it. Um, so, so when you walk in, uh, the idea is one that that we're going to value um, whether they, you know, whether if if they don't speak it, that's fine. We of course will speak English, but we're going to value and and make sure that that the priority is that they understand we're going to value that, and and the culture is important too. Um, and we we've identified this is part of our culture of humility, right? Just because I'm Latina, just because I'm Mexican American, just because I'm, you know, doesn't mean that the the next person coming in the door that just because I speak the Spanish, just because I speak Spanish, that I'm gonna not, I'm gonna say something, um, I'm gonna say a, a word that that definitely not understood by them, or that I'm not gonna say anything that's not uh, that that. Could, could jeopardize the relationship because I am so more um, Americanized. I am so much more uh, distance. Um, but who we have working with us are folks and, and they're immigrants. Um, they, they come from, uh, we have Peru, Venezuela. Um, so a lot of the Eastern and Southern. Uh, and what I can tell you is that what we noticed the change of uh, when they were coming south of the border from Mexico has now really emerged in a lot of people from Honduras. So we, we do have someone who works with us from Honduras, um, from uh, Central and South America in, in, in those. So, so the idea is that we also have folks that are here helping us um, value you know, that and understand any differences, whether it be languages, whether it be, because, you know, sometimes words uh, really can play on us and we learn that the hard way. And then the other is, um, the other is, is just culture, you know, just what we, we, we notice uh, the different foods that are being introduced that I'm like, what is that? <laughs> and, and valuing um, music and culture and language in a way that um, that now that now shows us how how different we are even within the Latino community. Um, so so what I will tell you is um, that it's not just about demographics; it's about the stories and it's about learning who in your community and uh, where in your community we connect. Um, and then building those authentic relations. I can't say that enough, is that um, who you build uh, the relationships with that, that most definitely can, can help you, you know, move in. So for us, uh, it goes both ways. So uh, some of our evangelical and Pentecostal churches that are popping up, we form relationships with them and we form relationships with them by coming in and learning about them, sharing what we can. Then we just ask, um, can we hold a workshop? Can we, you know, so it's, it's really opening up a door. Now we have actually ambassadors, what we call ambassadors, they're not our promotoras per se, but they're ambassadors to be able to, to really now then connect us to some of their parishioners that have issues, that may have language uh, barriers, but that they have issues. And, and we don't do a lot of mental health. So like right now, mental health is really huge. I mean, in other words, when I say we don't do it, we have access, but we don't, we don't have a therapist. And, and it's the connection, right? It's the referrals real easy, but we do fiestas at their locations. We ask them to sponsor our 
um, you know, so every Christmas when we have, when, when, when we, um, uh, you know, do different kind of activities, we ask them to sponsor, which means the women in the church, you know, will do all the food, the, the, the tamales, the, you know, and, and then we'll, we'll bring in others. So it's also the idea that we're also bringing people in that might not be a part of the congregation, um, but could be, right? So, so we're, we're establishing the connection between community and establishing the a connection between the congregation in a way that takes things outside, brings things inside. That's the value that I think we hold and, mm -hmm. and the need to make sure um, that we're collaborating in a way that again, doesn't violate, just like we tell the archdiocese, we're not gonna violate your Catholic teachings. Um, um, but at the same time, um, you know, the, that's what the church is, right? It is community. It is kind of like who we are. So one of the things that I think was really important that I wrote down, I don't know if I said it, but I'll say it again. Um, you want to you want to walk in and join kind of where life is already ha happening and it doesn't happen in those four walls but you have people who value the church that you already have that can connect you in, in the community use them use their skill sets use who they know in the community whether it be latino community african american community disabled community homeless community they know they live in that community, right? They, they, that's, that's who they are. And, and to be intentional where you are and, and what's around you means that, that you're just as much becoming knowledgeable about where, so it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a huge city. It doesn't have to even be a huge county, the neighborhood, right? So one of the things we did that our council did that I said, you know, there's a lot of people around that, that, that live around your church that we have not uh, kind of impacted. What can we do um, to value that? So even if it's just like a cleanup day where you invite everyone to come out of their homes, um, it's, it's, it's really making connections and valuing uh, what's happening in a way that says you're, it, it, it takes time it takes relationships. It takes, you know, kind of building that trust. And, 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 but the value is that there's a lot of life happening outside the four walls that, that you can be connected to and a lot of people doing some good things that you can collaborate with and not feel like you, you have to give a lot, but you're sure going to get a lot. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Irene and Irene and I'm just looking at the time and yeah. really, I asked you questions and I left no space for other people to so I'm going to uh, to ask if you have a question if you wouldn't mind typing in the comments. And just let me know and that way, since I can't see everyone's face for don't raise your hand and just type in um, to um, and I will certainly unmute you so you can have a chance to. Yeah, we can talk to people. <laughs> and Miss Sylvia, um, go ahead and, and. Oh, Sylvia, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I was just going to ask is there a network or um, some type of, of uh, resource to find organizations such as yours across the country? You know, are you, I realize yeah. you're independent to some extent, but I would assume you're connected as well. Which is, uh, um, I'm glad you asked because that was part of what I didn't. Um, say either. We actually are an affiliate of, um, of uh, Unidos US. It used to be the National Council of La Raza, but it's UN, let me, U-N-I-D-O-S US. There, we are affiliates. We are, are Latino focused organizations across the country that are affiliated to this kind of, it's the, it's the largest kind of civil rights and advocacy organizations for Latinos in the country. Uh, as a matter of fact, who runs it is uh, someone who was actually born and raised here in Kansas City, Kansas. She is um, uh, Janet Murguia and she runs the national organization. And um, 
So there are affiliates across the country. Their clinics, their social service organizations, their um, you know shelter. They they run shelters. They run uh, clinics. I could say a lot more. Um, but yes, they will have affiliates in every state across the country. Look them up. They I should have thrown that out as well. And you can find that in Salvation Armies. You can find that uh, national um, in, in things like Boys and Girls Club, if it's youth, you know, um, also, uh, who am I thinking of? Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, you know, across the, the country are, um, are things like the Urban League that will have... Um, that will also have uh, affiliates across the country because there is a national urban league, NAACPs across every country and in your uh, areas, especially if it's kind of communities of color and, and working with communities of color. If there's, um, there, there's gonna be a number of small, uh, of course, um, grassroots organizations, but national organizations uh, are important to also connect with. Thank you, Irene. I'm gonna leave it open for any other questions um, as I wanna make sure that I'm allowing space for that as I did commit to. Thank you for opening up um, particularly such a uh, contentious topic um, when it comes to immigration or it comes to the Latino community. Because you know what, uh, you know, what we very much have uh, been aware of is that when when the 80s you know throughout that that amnesty process I think people became a, a lot more comfortable of uh, in regard to th their place in this country um, the past four or five years it's been a, a much more difficult in in that our community has had high anxiety you know fearful of what it means um, because of the way they, they had been identified and described. And I think there's a lot of myths and a lot of misunderstandings. And, and one of the things that we try to do is to do a lot of this to a lot of conversation around, uh, let me answer. As a matter of fact, last night I got a text from uh, a gentleman who, who, who runs, um, he, well, he's, he's very much involved in the African-American community. And uh, so I get these late at night or I get them early in the morning. And, and his question is, you know, I heard that uh, undocumented, undocumented people were getting stimulus this time around. Why? Why, why, should, I, why should, should I not be angry about that? So, you know, it is, I am, I'm respectful of the fact that those are, are legitimate questions that people, you know, have. And uh, we had a back and forth at 1130 last night, a back and forth about why I'm not going to be apologetic and what he needs to understand about I-10 and, and almost, you know, $13 billion that undocumented uh, put into our social security system and our Medicaid system and that they will never see because they're not qualified to get it, but that if we took that out of our system, where would we be? Um, so, so I don't mind those conversations and, and I don't mind having them. Um, I'm never going to change people's minds, but I want them to get all of the information about who we serve, not just kind of an idea about who they, you know, how much they are of a drain on our system, which is what I hear a lot, which is far from the truth. So the economic impact, uh, the need for us to really kind of think of comprehensive immigration reform, um, the understanding about who we are as an as a, a community, um, you know, we 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 value people reaching out, and we value the questions, and we value the understanding that. We're here, a part of the community, um, from second generation folk like me to new, uh, if, uh, you know, new immigrant resident uh, to, you know, mixed status families that have been here for about 20 years now. 20, uh, our average, 
our average is probably about um, our average has been here about more like 15 years in this community and have established a family. And I should have told you, did I tell you that so on it, so of the about 80,000 Latinos that are in both when we serve, we actually serve probably about 12,000 Latinos on a given year. So, um, you know, as much as there might be a need, uh, we don't hit everyone um, that comes through our door, but we do value, um, you know, being in the community and being here for our, our, our community and we value these opportunities. Um, if you don't have any questions, don't, you know, I, I, you are more than welcome. I don't, Jennifer, did you give my contact information or should I? I have not, but that was going to be your request. Yeah, please do, because there's no question that I won't answer and and no, you know, I, I won't, it's not, I will never uh, look at someone uh, for a question that is, because every question really I, I value because any opportunity I can get to give you the right information. Um, so not, there's no question, it's a bad question. I've heard it all about our community. Trust me, I've 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 heard it from you know from our our uh, well we heard it from our uh, um, previous administration. I've heard it from mayors, police chiefs. I've heard it from, but the idea is that we still have to um, we still have to come together and value um, the the role that we play in advocacy, but also in the stories that I could tell. And I think there um, you know one of the I have so many different ways that I'm going to use you as a resource moving forward, but one of those, and I've had the, an opportunity to be in conversations with a number of pastors who are potentially in a smaller church that um, has not, they have not gotten outside of the uh, stereotypical assumptions about communities that don't live <coughs> them and aren't from where they're from. Right. I have those conversations that are uncomfortable. Yep. So I think that, um, you know, you are such a great resource as a woman who is obviously very strong in faith, but yet you have such a loving heart and how you answer those questions um, in a way that, um, that I think it, it is a safe space for all people. Um, yep. so I, I appreciate knowing that you can be that resource for each of us as, as we um, yeah, I sit at a council table um, uh, in my parish, uh, not the parish that's the Spanish speaking parish or the parish that my priest serves. It, so he serves a uh, predominantly African American Catholic parish. He serves the Spanish language parish, and then he serves an older, you know, good, um, so I sit at that, I actually attend that parish, not one of the other two, but I, have a, I really don't have a choice because of their boundaries, right? But, but I value being able to go from one to the other if I miss a mass um, you know, in, in my parish. And uh, I sit at tables. I still sit at tables with, with folks that still uh, will say some things, um, you know, I, that I, I say, oh, like, you know, my preference is undocumented. Please don't use the I word, the I, you know, the, the legal alien word. Please, if you can, I, I just will tell you unauthorized, undocumented. Uh, now I know that they're going to walk away and say the same thing. But, but I think what we've done is we've learned together because we, we did take the steps of the demographic and who's moving in and why you know, legacy in a, in a church is really important, but who's going to be coming in is, is not the same at who is leaving. So I would love to. Thank you so much. And I know Sylvia is gonna close us out with some silent oh. prayer, but- Sorry. Yeah, no, really you're fine. <laughs> permission i'm going to go ahead and share your information and god bless you thank you so much for being thank here. you thank, thank you, you very much you. yes show thank you thank you um so as we announced before this meeting uh before this this time together we would like to please just take um, a moment of silence as we are gathered this forum was sponsored by women in ministry and we would like to have a moment of silence and recognition of those lives that were 
um, taken last week in Atlanta in an act of uh, racist and genderized violence that is just why we're wearing black um, today in recognition of the ongoing violence and rape that occurs uh, around the globe for women. So please join me in a moment of silence. And if you would, please just join me for a moment of blessing. Thank you so much, Irene, for bringing us this good work today. Thank you all for coming and gathering and sharing this sacred space. And as you go out into the rest of your day, carry the words of comfort, carry the words of the pain that has been lifted for those who are disenfranchised. Carry the strength of a woman, the strength of the feminine, the strength of the sacred God that we serve, knowing that this God that we serve is the God of all and serves and, and outside of the constraints and the constructs of gender, outside of the constraints and constructs of race, of socioeconomic, of location, of the things that we place as boundaries and separations of humanity. We serve the God who overcomes all of those things. And we are so grateful for that. Thank you all so much. Go in peace. Peace. Thank you. Thank you so much.